right. So uh, welcome everyone to another uh, episode of um, our um, Poets Talk Politics show that we've been uh, running here at the Comparative Literature Institute of the University of Porto. Today, our uh, guest is uh, again from the United States, um, Holly Melgarth, and we're going to be talking about her new book, uh, which you know came out a few weeks ago, I, I believe, a few uh, few days a few days ago. I, I don't know, Holly, um, called "Fetal Position," and uh, I'm going to just introduce everyone, and then Holly's going to read a little bit from from the book. So we have uh, our you know, ever present <laughs> guest on the show, Elena Siltanen, who is a, a literature researcher and currently teaches at the Department of English at Lund University in Sweden. Her current research focuses on contemporary American poetry, more specifically on how emotion, emotional relations are constructed in the reading event and how poetry can situate readers in complex positions. Most recently, she has published, for example, an article on connections between conceptualism and confessionalism in the Journal of Modern Literature, and another essay on metamodernism and new sincerity in the English Studies uh, Journal. Her book, uh, Experimentalism as Reciprocal Communication in Contemporary American Poetry, uh, was published uh, by John Benjamins in 2016. She has a double doctoral degree from the University of Turku in Finland and Lulea University of Technology in Sweden. And then we have, uh, for the first time on the show, we have a colleague of mine here in uh, Porto, Ines Cardoso, who is a PhD student in uh, literary, cultural, and interartistic studies here at the University of Porto. She is being funded uh, by the uh, Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology um, to do a thesis on uh, the poets Antonio Aragão and, and uh, Salet Tavares, both, both uh, Portuguese poets. Uh, she has a BA in um, Modern Languages and Cultures uh, in uh, Portuguese and English. Um, and she did an, an MA in Literary, Cultural, and Interartistic Studies um, with a focus on, you know, comparative literature and intercultural studies. Um, and she did a thesis on the Portuguese poet Alberto Pimenta. She's been uh, doing work on uh, experimental, uh, Portuguese experimental poetry and uh, performance art. She is a researcher at the Comparative Literature Institute, and she recently uh, co-founded the interartistic uh, magazine uh, Schema. You can you can uh, you know find the website to the uh, magazine on uh, Ines's uh, profile. And then we have uh, uh, Holly Melgard, uh, who um, this is actually uh, you know a fetal position is actually Holly's first full-length full book of poetry. So it's, you know, congratulations, Holly. It's very, very nice. Uh, her other works include Poems for Baby, which was a trilogy, uh, The Making of Americans, Black Friday, Reimbursement, which are all, I believe, from, uh, all came out in uh, Troll Thread, Cats Can Taste Su uh, Sugar, and the chapbook uh, Cat Call, uh, which came out um, in uh, Ugly Duckling. Uh, along with uh, Joey Uris Algazin, she co authored White Trash and Liquidation, and she's uh, one of the founding editors of uh, Troll Thread, along with uh, Joey, uh, Chris Sylvester, and Divya Victor. They're a, a collectively edited website offering experimental poetry books, uh, both uh, for print on demand and free PDF download. She recently completed a PhD at the State University of New York at Buffalo in the po uh, Poetics program with a thesis titled uh, Poetics of Ubiquitization, Textual Conditions of and for the Ubiquitous Computing Age. Uh, she currently teaches at uh, New York University and the City University of New York, is a freelance book designer and co-edits uh, co uh, Troll Thread Press. And she, currently lives in Brooklyn. Uh, welcome, Holly, and feel free to start your reading. 
Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk with you, Joao and Alina and Inej. Um, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read for a while from this book. And I was thinking we would just go on a journey together, you know, like just take a little nature hike. So settle in. Um, these is a fetal position, I've been self-publishing book length works for a while that have been much more image-based in the past. Um, and this is my first one with an outside editor. Uh, these are pieces I made over the last 10 years during my emergence as a poet, more or less, um, as I was doing this work alongside through Troll Thread exploring like performative paratext and, and POD performance uh, and print on demand. Um, so as I was like exploring this kind of medium and its nascence, this art of print on demand, this is kind of what I was making alongside of it, exploring emergence more formally. Um, and so the first half of the book kind of focuses more on maternal labor. The second half of the book kind of takes us more into a focus on nascent and emergent labor. Um, those two factors are present in each one of these poems. And I was thinking I would just kind of take us across the book and just read bits and pieces of five different points in the book. Um, and maybe this could give us a sense of orality and musicality running through the text. Um, it's very, you know, vernacular heavy, uh, which I realized can be kind of weird silently reading at a distance if you're not a native English speaker. So I was thinking we could just like have fun with the music of the language for a while. Okay, so what's our person? Um, starts with some epigraphs. Uh, the first is Audrey Lord's poetry is not a luxury. It is through poetry that we give name to those ideas which are until the poem nameless and formless about to be birthed but already felt. That distillation of experience from which true poetry springs births thought as dream, births concept, as feeling, births idea, as knowledge, births or precedes understanding. And the second uh, is Giorgio Ogamben's infancy and history. That which has its place of origin in infancy must keep on traveling toward and through infancy. I'll read the third when I get two different parts. That's enough epigraphs for now. Lesser person. My son is the only person in his world who speaks his language. We adopted him after he was found in a field, limping on a broken leg, half starved and severely dehydrated. I'd say we're lucky they found him when they did, but perhaps he wasn't built to survive the horrors of what he's been through. For much of the day, he stares out the window, watching, waiting. Even when it's warm enough to leave the window open overnight, he knows better than to escape. Instead, he waits. The slow droning passage of time is the tyrant of a life without peers. He hasn't a mutual in this world. He waits. Because he is the only one of his kind in this world, he is therefore utterly always alone. But he's not the only one in the house. Like most people, he lives among an ecosystem of bugs and small rodents. Unlike most people, however, he takes pleasure in torturing those who are smaller than he. Just now, he has maimed someone smaller than himself again. No matter how much they writhe on the floor and squeal for relief, he refuses to kill them and spare them further pain. Each time they gather the strength enough to begin to escape his clutches, he pulls them back with a hook, pushes their face into the ground, and patiently waits for them to try it again. This is how he plays. He is teaching them to understand mercy as he once did, that there is none. He lives to see them learn the lesson that the bigger and stronger will inevitably weaken the smaller by treating them as weaker. This is what the smaller, this is what happens to the smaller. This is what the smaller are for. This is what they have always been for. And by they, he means him. The world is too dangerous for someone like him and he is too dangerous for it. At all times, he needs to dominate and aggress others to make them feel as he does, a victim. Our son is too small, too weak and too soft for this world. He can't handle going somewhere without A, it destroying him or B, him destroying it. That's why we don't let our son leave the house under any circumstances except for doctor visits. We've taught him to never open the door to strangers and we ask visitors to always close the door behind them. It would never occur to him to bolt out of an open window, but who knows what he'd do or, or what would happen to him given the opportunity of an open door. 
I am among the matrix of what he considers to be the lesser persons in the house, and sometimes he tortures me, but I'm willing to tolerate the abuse because I love my son and I know it suits him. As his mother, I am a slave to his well-being, not the other way around, and he knows it. Sometimes he plays this game where he bats at scraps and bits of air where no one else is even around. He is driven to do it more times than he can find victims, unsuspecting students for which to teach this lesson. Through homeschooling, I've taught him everything he knows, including who he is and what he's for, but my son is illiterate. It's completely his own fault. I've tried teaching him to read and write and speak in English, but he refuses to learn. I don't think he wants a vocabulary to better articulate the specifics of his life. Ignorance is the only bliss he knows. If we can call that bliss, he wouldn't call it that. A person without language doesn't call anything. He's a real handful. Truth be told though, I don't really want him to acquire a language to tell me what he really thinks anyway. The last thing he needs is one more tool for imprisoning on others the experiences he's lived and now relives. He's more docile and controllable this way. Surgically eliminating his ability to have children has also helped. Even though he doesn't use any words to communicate with us, he definitely signals things about his history through his behavior. For instance, my son eats on all fours off of a dish on the floor. He refuses to sit up at the table and use silverware like a normal person. I keep telling him that's how animals eat, not people. He is a master at showing without telling us how he feels. Today, he vomited directly into his food again. This is not unusual for him. It happens pretty frequently. He doesn't do it because he's sad. If he were sad, he wouldn't know it, for sadness is all he's ever known. My son likely vomits so often because he eats horizontally and the esophagus wasn't built to work sideways. But he's, uh, he doesn't just vomit in his bowl either. He experiments with throwing up on all kinds of stuff around the house, a hairbrush, a pile of books, the box of clothes for donation, some unopened mail. He's likely doing it simply to feel something, anything at all. He does it on purpose. When the window is open and he can feel the air from outside, he lives to listen to its sounds and smell its information. So long as that portal is open, he can't be distracted from peering out of it, even for a moment. That is, until he can't take it anymore. After about an hour of sitting beside an open window, he'll inevitably curl up into a ball on the floor. If I bother him when he's in this state by trying to help him sit back up at the window again, he'll maybe play along for a minute or two, but as soon as a loud truck passes or a car alarm goes off, he'll drop back down to the floor again. I don't think the sights and sounds become too overstimulating for him. I think that contemplating the big world beyond him makes him increasingly realize how small and helpless he is by comparison, until eventually his body needs to physically mirror that feeling. At a certain point, one can't tolerate feeling that small without curling up into a fetal position. He often naps in the fetal position. Whenever he succumbs to the weight of the world beyond himself, he does this, and he doesn't just do it at the window or in his bed, and he doesn't just do it at the he doesn't just do it at the window in his bed. He'll pretty much sleep this way wherever the feeling hits, right then and there, at the foot of a chair, in the middle of the kitchen floor, blocking the front door. He'll curl up on top of whatever objects happen to be beneath him in that moment. That these objects sometimes collapse and break beneath his weight only vindicates how he feels. He does this despite and to spite the given function of the space and the things inside of it. For him, the fetal position is a meditation on the form reproductive labor. So I'm moving that poem there, we're moving on. There's more to it, but <laughs> we're taking a tour here. Reproductive labor, uh, an epigraph. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks. People keep asking me if I want kids and I don't know how to answer that question. I suspect I might want kids, but I don't know if I want kids because I don't know what wanting kids is supposed to feel like. I'm pretty sure I wanna have had kids, you know, in retrospect, only because I don't wanna feel like I missed out on anything. But is that what wanting a child feels like? Does it feel similar to the desire to have paid off your bills or to have attended that event you feel obligated to go to but don't have the energy for? What does it feel like to know you want children? 
is wanting kids a physical sensation. Like when you look at other people's kids, do your loins start burning and dilating with want for something to come out of them? I can sort of imagine that. Does looking at a baby make your womb throb, your sperm squirm, your wallet pulse? I don't know, you tell me. I'm not asking to make fun because I think it's funny. I genuinely wanna know, what does wanting kids feel like? When I'm hungry, the emptiness in my stomach makes it ache. Do you feel an emptiness in your torso when you want kids? At a certain point, will I get hangry for a child to fill up my midsection if I wait too long? Or is wanting kids less of an internal feeling or lack or craving belonging to any one body part, more of a holistic, overall physical longing for another? You know, like when you've been single for so long that all you can think about is who among your friends you can convince to spoon you without it getting weird. Is it a body loneliness thing or does wanting a child feel like it does when I see a baby animal and all I want to do is hold it? I mean, the last thing I want to do is chores for helpless animals. Those creatures just look like food to me but I would hold the shit out of any baby animal that would let me. I don't know if that's a baby thing so much as a cuddling thing. Baby animals make great hot water bottles by and large. I would spoon most full grown animals too for that matter, provided they have, they have fur and aren't too vicious or smelly. Well, actually I would spoon an elephant or a hippo, probably also an ostrich. So yeah, most if not animals, I would definitely spoon. But wanting to spoon that raccoon rummaging in the trash doesn't necessarily mean I'm prepared, prepared to care for it by say, showing up for all its vaccination appointments. I mean, if I haven't managed to go to any dentist appointments in the last five years, how can I be trusted to follow through on vaccinations? I guess it's not totally my fault I haven't been to the dentist. My insurance pay only pays for one cavity a year, but I have at least five, which doesn't bode well for my all or nothing perfectionism. Does wanting children feel anything like preferring to work one job instead of the three I have? Is it part of an urge to simplify your life and consolidate options? I bet if I had a kid, daily decision-making would become way easier. Do I wanna stay out at this bar, go home? What city do I wanna live in? Can I eat chips for dinner? I'll bet limiting my options would make the answers to these kinds of questions become more obvious. Would having kids liberate my time like a, product, a set of productive constraints? Sometimes it feels really good to cook a loved one a meal or do something nice for them, like knit them a scarf or draw them a card. Does wanting a kid feel like the desire to serve another? I don't mean that in a judgy way. I'm asking because it seems like there can be real pleasure in that. I would love for the act of cooking dinner to feel more like my pleasure than my burden. Chores in general, make them less painful, please, by all means. Living in the service of another sounds nicer to me than living in the service of self. Is that how people come to want kids? the need for the object of their desire to be intelligibly, tangibly external from themselves. I can relate to that. I remember what strongly wanting things felt like when I was a child, but I don't think I'm very good at knowing how to want things strongly as an adult. It's possible that's because most of the time, I don't feel like I'm much of an adult. I make negative income. Someone else owns my shelter. I'm scared and overstimulated most of the time. I have no assets and I can't begin to imagine myself in the future. Statements that are just as true today as they were when I was a child. Do you have to strongly not identify with children to want one of your own? Because I don't know how to not feel infantilized by the conditions of my life. Or is the feeling of wanting children more like the feeling of wanting to create a world in which others admire you, fear, and respect you? Like a superiority thing? Is that what it feels like? Because I would be down for that. I never not want that, to be honest. Although that is what Victor Frankenstein also won, and look how that turned out. We're moving on once again. Now I'm gonna read, I didn't wanna read divisions of labor just because I think like the, the paratexts out there, the interviews and writing about this book so far exists based on the pieces that I've previously published and divisions of labor came out earlier this year uh, as a chat book or earlier, uh, end of 2020, during the pandemic. I don't know, time is a flat circle now. I'm not really sure when, but it just recently came out through Make Now and now that's in this book. Uh, and in its original layout, it's laid out like a children's alphabet book. So you can kind of see the style of it. Um, but I realized that, you know, since like this week, actually the Supreme Court, it looks like is rolling back um, abortion rights for uh, certain states. Uh, and that it looks like the right to abortion in certain United States are, is going to disappear. It's like, 
I feel like I have to read the eulogy for jobs I would have applied for in those states. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like trying to find a fucking job. So now I have to read this. I apologize. That's why this uh, reading is going to go long. I blame the Supreme Court. Divisions of labor. A transcribed alphabetized list of sounds uttered during dramatic portrayals of childbirth in YouTube videos. And the uh, epigraph, I have an epigraph for it now, Sylvia Federici from Precarious Labor and Reproductive Work. Once we say that reproductive work is a terrain of struggle, we have to first immediately confront the question of how we struggle on this terrain without destroying the people you care for. This is a problem mothers as well as teachers and nurses know very well. Okay. Ah. Uh. Uh, 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 M, an anesthesia, R, er, asshole, e, I, I, ba, baby, baby boy, baby girl, baby is being born, baby is coming, baby is here, ba, bastard, you bastard, be a baby, birth, bitch, bo, ba, boy, boyfriend, breastfeed, breathe, I am breathing, break it, broke it, just broke, ba, ba, Cesarean. Can can you see it? Can't. I can't. Careful. Ka cervix. Cocksucker. Coming. It's coming. Contracting. Contractions. Crap. C section. Ka. Ka. Da. Da. Damn. Damn it. Daughter. Dead. Is it dead? De. Day. Die. Do it. Do you see a head? Do you see it? Do you see the head? Doctor. Do. Don't drugs, duh, duh, dying, eee, eh, eh, epidural, fa, fa, farther, go any farther, father, four for fuck's sakes, for the love of God, force, forcing, fuck, fuck me, fucker, fucking hell, further, a little further, further, much further, yeah. Get it out, get me, get out, get out of me. Give, give me, girl, girlfriend, give it to me. Give me something, giving birth, go, God, going, gone. Grr, 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 grr. Ha, he, 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 hear it. Head, is there a head? Ha, 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 help, help me, her, fr, ho, holy shit, ho, 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 ho. Hold it, I can't hold it. Who, who, how, ha, huh? ha. <sighs> Husband, hurt it, hurting hurts. I, I am, I am, I am trying. I can't, I just, I think it's almost, I'm trying in, inside me. Is it, is it really happening? It can't, it can, it isn't, it's, it's really happening. It just, it just won't, it won't. It's happening, it's time. Ja, ja, jeez. Jesus, Jesus Christ, J just, ka, ka, keep it, keep it, keep, kill it, kill me, kill me, oh God, kill me, kill the pain, kill you, ka, labia, labor, la, leave, leave it, leave me alone, Ooh. little, little baby, little boy, little girl, little one, ma, ma, make it me, me, mm. Mommy, mom, mother, motherfucker, ma, my, my baby, my water broke. Name, no, no, don't, no, I can't, no, just, no, no, oh, no, 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 oh, 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 baby, oh, God, oh, my God, oh, oh, ow, ouch, ow, 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 okay, okay, ow, ouch, ow, ow, get it out of me, over with, over yet, ow, ha. Pain, papa, parent, partner, pig, placenta, please, please, please help me, pregnant, put it, put me, quit, quit it, Ra, ra. relax, relax, I'm trying to relax, relaxed enough, relaxation, rest, ra. save it, save me, saw, see, see, I can't see it, see it, can you see it, shit, Sleep, so, son, son of a bitch, sorry, stick it, stir up, stomach, stuck, stuck, is it stuck, it's stuck, isn't it, is it stuck, ta, ta, take it, take it out, take me, tap water, take, the, they, time, it's time, to, trying, I am trying, trying to, ta, uh-huh, um, 
umbilical. Um, mm. Mm. Uterus, vagina, very, very much, very, very. Wow. Wow. Water, we, woo. What is it? When is it? When will it? Where is he? Where is it? Where will I? Will it? Will he? Will she? Will they? Will you? Who? Whoa. Who? 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 Why won't it? Worse pain. Wow. Whoa. Ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, ex-husband, ex-partner, ex-wife. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it's coming. Yes, it did. You, you bastard. You can't, you can't just, you cocksucker, you coward. You have no idea. You have to, you piece of shit, you pig, you motherfucker, you son of a bitch. You'll have to, you'll need to, you're dead to me. You're going to pay. You're not supposed to. You're, you're, it's divisions of labor. Okay. So almost there now, only two more left. We're gonna do student labor. Let me do the final epigraph from the front to go with it. This is um, from Sylvia Federici's Precarious Labor, A Feminist Viewpoint. The precarity of labor is rooted in the new forms of production. Where am I? Here it is. Student labor. Oh, hi, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I've been really, yeah, it's been good, it's good. So I'm good, yeah, well, yeah, well, I'm so glad you called because I was just about to, well, no, not yet, not yet. No, sorry about that. No, I, I don't have that part yet, but yeah, no, I still haven't. Oh no, but that's okay, I did get that, yeah. But you know, I still haven't gotten the, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just in the middle of getting it now, so exactly, right. Yeah, so I'm almost done now, but you know what? Well, no, it's just been taking me a little longer than I, oh no, I know, no, I know, I know. No, I, I'm going to, yeah, no, exactly. But so it's almost there now, it is. It's only, it is, right, it is. It's just a little bit, yeah, no, totally, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I just, well, I am, I just, I need to finish this other part before that, but then once I, Right. But before I can wrap that up, first I got to get the, no, yeah, and you told me that. So what I did was I, no, I know. Right. But before I can do that, first I need to, right. Yes. And well, I wanted to, but then it didn't exactly, I mean, it never, right. So, okay. I'll do that first. Yeah. So then I'll have that for you shortly, just after I, mm hmm Yes. Oh, wait, the which one? The, Oh, right, that, also that too, also that too. But wait, what time was that at? No, yeah, no, I'll, I'll totally be there. Yeah, I, I was already planning on it, so. Yeah, no, so you'll see me there. I was just gonna grab it and then head down. Right, so I'll have that for you then when you see me there. Well, no, I know, no, I know. But you know, I still don't know how the, but you know, it's really no big deal because I'm sure I'll find it soon. and. And then once I do, it'll be right. But, but I can just figure it out. So it's all good. Yeah. So no, I'll take care. Yeah. That's really no big deal. Oh, oh, well then, yeah, then no. Yeah. Then so, yeah, I can do that too. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. So then, okay. And that too, then sure. I'll just write. So then, okay, I'll have that first thing with the others just as soon as, well, no, but it's okay. You know, I just have to find out the, right, because, you know, I still haven't found the, well, no, because I, first I have to learn how to do it before I can do that. Right, but that's totally cool. I just have to find where it is to learn it. Yeah, no, it's just, it's in some forum somewhere and I'm just like, I'm like, yeah, I'm just like browsing all these forums and it's just taking me forever, but no. That's okay. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. And I'm fine. Yeah, no. And I, I'm figuring it out as we speak. So I, yeah, no, right, exactly. I'll have those ready in no time, no sweat. And then, but you know, if you could just send me the list, then I could just, oh, well, that's okay. No, no, that's fine. No, I, I figured you wouldn't, so. No, but well, no, you never did send that to me, but that's okay, Re really, it was, 
And I mean, I didn't really need it. I, I basically just figured it out on my own. But actually, would you mind sparing a moment when you get a sack? And yeah, if you could just send that sometime when you're not too. Oh no, that's okay. That's no problem. Yeah, no, I totally understand. Yeah. No, I know you're busy. I, I figured you wouldn't. Yeah, no. No, I know. Definitely not. Wow, yeah, no. Yeah, I'm just so thankful for your. Yeah, no, exactly. Also, yeah, yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, no, I was going to say, also, thank you so much again for your patience. Oh, all right. Okay, sure. Oh, that's no problem. Ask me anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, right. Hmm. Well, okay. Well, if you're trying to do it in PowerPoint, then all you have to do is, okay, so you drag the text box next to the image. And then once you've done that, it should just align on its own. But if it's, well, okay, if it's not doing what you want, then I guess just click on the box in the menu bar at the top there, the little tile with the parallel lines that are all left aligned there. Do you see that? Right. Okay. It's not, and because you're not, well, that's okay. No, yeah, no, just try it. Try it while I'm here. That's okay. No, that's fine. I'll wait. That's fine. No, I don't mind. Yeah, no, I'm right here. Okay, so now all you do is you, right, take the text box and drag it next to the image that you wanted, and then it should just align. That's okay. Just click update later. And no, not with the cursor, the mouse. No, the cursor is not the mouse. Yeah, no. The blinking line. That's not what you want. You want the arrow. Right. Yeah, no, no, that's the mouse. Use the arrow. Right. Yes. So now, Take the, take the arrow and you place it out over the box of text where the, and then just click and hold down. And when you click, that's gonna grab it. And if you hold the click down, that should allow you to drag it over. Do you see that? Well, probably because you didn't click, but if you did click and you hold the click down, then it should, right. So it's not right. No, I know you're in a hurry. Yeah, okay. So then in that case, if you're not, Right. But well, I mean, if, if you really need this before your flight and it won't. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, certainly not. I understand. No, exactly. No, yeah, no. Agreed. No, understood. Yes. No, exactly. No, you're right. Leave that there too. And then with cat call. From Amy Cesaire's Monsters. My terror is in seeing the squad of the nameless emerge. And from Sarah Schulman's Conflict is Not Abuse. Just as unresolved, formerly subordinated or traumatized individuals can collude with or identify with bullies, so can unresolved, formerly subordinated or traumatized groups of people identify with the supremacy of the state. In both cases, the lack of recognition that the past is not the present leads to the newly acquired power to punish rather than the self-transformation necessary to resolve conflict and produce justice. Oh my God, check out that guy over there. Oh my God, look at him. Look at what a guy he is. Hey, cute guy. Hey, hey you. Hey, hi. Hi, cutie. How are you? He sure is cute. Oh my God. Look at how cute he is. Holy shit, he's a cute one. Jesus Christ, look at him. Look at that guy being such a guy. Oh my God, what a guy. Talk about a guy. Hey guy, hey guy, 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 guy. Yeah, you guy, hi guy. Hey, you're a really cute guy, you sure are. Oh my God, he's a cute guy. Oh, he is a guy, he is, isn't he? Dude, just look, look. Look at what a fucking guy he's being. He's just being a really, really cute little guy right now. Hey, cute one, look at you. You're a cute little guy, aren't you? You, you are, you're a huge cute little guy. Yes, you are, the hugest. It's okay, I like that, I like you. Look at what a guy he's being, look at him go. I'll bet he just needs to cuddle right now. And that's why he's being like that. He probably does. You know, it's true. Hey, pretty big, cute little guy. Do you need to cuddle? Do you? Do you want to cuddle a little bit? Because I can cuddle and I can tell you're a cuddler. Oh, I can't. You sure are. Look at this bud. Goddamn baby body. That's what he's got, baby bod. What's up, small bod? What's up, small baby bud? What's up with your small butt? Let me get your butt. 
Jesus Christ, look at this guy. Yeah, look at him over there with this small butt. Look at that baby butt he's got going on. Look at him go. Oh my God, look at you go. Hey, baby butt, can I please have your small butt now? Oh, come on, I want it now. It's okay, we can do this. You're just gonna need to give me your small butt right now, that's all. He's gonna need to give me his butt. That's what he's gonna need to do, and I'm gonna need to have him. Come on, little guy, come be my butt, be my bud. I'll be your friend, come on. I'll bet you're fun. I'll bet he is fun. Yeah, I'll bet you're fun. You look like it. You probably got one of those fun butts, don't you? Anyone that small has got to be from Little Town. Oh, he has to be, he just has to. He must, yeah, I'll bet he is. In fact, I know he is. He's definitely the littlest one from Little Town and that is where he's from. It's true, it's true. He is the littlest one from Little Town. He can't help it because he's that small. No, he can't help it, no. Hey, you little bud, let me get your little cute, fun, cute guy bod. I want your bod, little one. Yeah, he's definitely the littlest one from Little Town with how small he's being right now. It's true, that's how small he's being. He is being that small, he is. He's so small, he probably calls it Littleton like he's really from there. You know he does. Hey bud, where are you going with your little bitty bod? Can I please have your bud bod? Come on, I wanna have your bod now. Let me have it. Littleton, that's what the locals call it. All the locals and all, all the little, wait, <laughs> all the locals in Little Town call it Littleton. It's true, they really do. That's how you know when they're really little enough to be from Little Town. You know they're a real little Tony and then they call it Littleton. That's how they say it too, Littleton. They say it just like that. It's true, they do, Littleton. I mean, for fuck's sakes, look at him. He is definitely, without a doubt, the goddamn littlest little Tony and from Littletown. And that is what he is. I know it. Look at him calling it Littleton to himself in his head while he's walking there. Hey, Mr. Bitty Bud. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Hey, Mr. Boo. Come on, be my mister. For fuck's sakes, look at him. Look at his small body headed back to his tiny home in Little Town as we speak, calling it Littleton just like that, like it were nothing, saying it that way like everyone else called it Littleton too, like everyone else in the world called it Littleton and not Little Town, which you know to any Little Tony and doesn't mean a goddamn thing. What's up, baby, sir? Come be my mister. Oh, come on, don't go. Take me with you. Maybe I can get him to take me back to Little Town with him. Hey, baby guy, take me back to Littleton with you. I want to meet your cute parents. There is just no way that anyone could ever be that small. It's just not possible. He's just being way too small to be this possible right now. And I don't like it. I'm sorry, but he's just too small. Way too fucking small. And it is not okay. Hey, bub. Hey, bubba. Hey, bubba, bub, bud. Hey, baby, bub. Fuck you. Fuck you and your ridiculously small body. Your smallness needs to stop now. I said stop. No means no. Fuck this guy's being body for being that small. Seriously, fuck him. Hey, bud bub, I'm gonna stop your body. Yes, I am. Someone needs to put a stop to all this smallness. I'm sorry, but his body just really needs to be stopped right now because there's just no way that anyone can be this small. No way, sir. No, you cannot be like this. No, you cannot. Nope, no way. Nobody's like that. No body. Hey, Mr. Guy, yeah, you, I'm talking to you. You're gonna be in my arms now because it's where you belong. Don't you walk away from me. You need to stop being so far from my body. Come be my bud. Come give me your bod. There's no point in fighting it because I'm gonna have you now, okay? Oh, come on, don't give me that. Come on. Let me stop there. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Holly. Uh, that was very nice, very funny as well. Uh, as we'll probably, something we'll probably talk about. Um, so, guys, do you want to go and ask some questions? Do you want to go, Elena? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thanks for a great reading. It's uh, it's really nice to hear it in this form. Um, it really uh, adds something. And I think um, the combination of the things that this book presents is interesting. Like, first, there's the... Uh, prose text and considering why one might want kids, and then uh, what is described as a transcribed alphabetized list of sounds uttered during dramatic portrayals of childbirth in YouTube videos, and um, um, then also other things like student labor that we also heard a series of statements that describes perhaps um, unfinished business and so on. 
So it's really um, an amalgamation of different approaches that seems to examine um, from several points of view, uh, maybe some kind of a larger common topic that is perhaps difficult to grasp, but I might say that it has a lot to do with being in the world under conditions that are contingent in a lot of ways. But it also reminds me of what poetry can do then. It's like an exploration of things like that. So I guess uh, what I'd like to ask is a really simple question. So do you want to talk more about your process of how you come across these different approaches and methods of um, approaching these different kinds of things? So do you maybe start out by thinking about what you want to say or what you want to do or something else? Um, I'm not sure where, I don't know if I can describe the magical moment that it clicks, but I will say that I love this question because it, it is a question about poesis, right? Like the, the act of actually making something. And a lot of the theories we have for talking about the formulas for making that occur, the ways the theories we've inherited as, as scholars and writers often revolve around these like deep abstractions and, and don't necessarily utilize the like the metaphor of like a scene of natality between like a maker and a made thing, a mother and a child a maternal figure and, and the one they're caretaking for. But like for this book, the thing that made me know that these things belong together was that each of these poems is kind of like exploring that dynamic as a scene. And I think for each of those scenes, each one there's some, the text itself is compiled out of some kind of either act of transcription or translation uh, uh, you know, from one medium to another or translating from one form to another. Um, and so each one is like trying to, act, you know, trying to, to work through actions of listening to an other, to myself, but that ends up being this weird feedback loop because I'm obsessed with echo chambers. So then there's this whole bias of taste and beauty that enters into the filter for how I decide what fits to. But I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, yeah, I think that's like kind of the starting point at least. Like all these things kind of fit into this kind of rough shape. And as I was in the poetics program, you know, I'm like, oh, poesis, tell me more about that. Like, look at the lack of women here. Like, hmm, maybe we could like consider maternal labor as part of the scene of that action. And so of course it's all deeply passive aggressive, but also, I don't know, hopefully useful. <laughs> yes, absolutely useful. Ineers, do you, do you want to ask yours now? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, Joan, for inviting me um, and for sharing all his poetry with me. And thank you for the, for the wonderful uh, reading. Uh, well, maybe it's possible that I'm going to touch on some aspects that you already mentioned, but um, one of the aspects that struck me when I was reading the book for the first time was the fact that a substantial number of poems were written, created, generated using techniques of appropriation. Uh, that's the case in child labor, where in order to create uh, a narration of childbirth from the fetal point of view, you cut up and reorder uh, pornographic descriptions of what it feels like to be inside of a woman. And that's also the, the case in divisions of labor, as you mentioned, where uh, you transcribe the list of sounds uttered during portrayals of childbirth in YouTube videos. So, of course, um, we know appropriation can be understood as a broad concept. The term can be used to describe different processes and gestures. But essentially, what I would like to ask you is, what's the role of appropriation in your creative process? What's the role of appropriation in this specific book? And if you think that appropriation is, especially nowadays, uh, an important tool in terms of political resistance, environmental awareness, gender equality advocacy, et cetera. So I would like to hear you on that. Thank you. I love that question. It's a generous question. <laughs> um, yeah, like it's it's hard to translate or transcribe, transfer something without taking it from somewhere. And so the relationship that we carry to that somewhere is always political. It's always fraught and there's always dynamics of power in play. I feel like for me, when it comes to the act of taking something and using it as artistic material, like 
before we were flagellating ourselves about appropriation and misappropriation on an institutional level between artists and scholars, you know, which was a big deal a couple of years ago, you know, like it was like, ah, oh, you took this wrong, you used this wrong, is that, um, and, and then writing after that kind of explosion of that moment, at least in the United States, I felt like in my scene, like maybe five, 10 years ago, there was a big explosion over some political wrong moves and appropriation. And then writers really moved over into uh, at least in my area, like a more lyric, self-centered style. Um, and, and prior to the appropri appropriation period of like maybe the last 15, 20 years that we really fixated in discourse, talking back and forth around those lines. Before that, I feel like the poetic American experimental community, and I, I'm not sure, I'm curious to hear what it seems like for you guys where you're sitting like in a more international like ear to the ground. Um, for me, what I found was that it was more fixated on representation, like after Edward Said's like saying, you know, for all the models we have for talking about, uh, you know, experience from the East and the Middle East, uh, that hemisphere, uh, wh where do we place like um, those narratives if all of them are getting rendered through a European uh, representational perspective? Like, how do we have an encounter with these communities, these cultures? How do we make them audible and findable without falsely representing them, right? And so there was a period before the appropriation period that was really uh, worried about representation. And in both of them, there was this fear and this conversation around doing it the wrong way. And a lot of, I think, academic and institutional behavior around kind of uh, attempting, punishing each other for doing it wrong, punishing ourselves, like a lot of apology and missteps and on a behavioral level, I find this a really interesting thing that we have this back and forth. And, and, and Nicholas Baudriot, who wrote um, uh, Politics of Aesthetics, I remember, he like writes about, not Politics of Aesthetics, um, Relational Aesthetics. Yeah, Relational Aesthetics. I remember he, he talked about this like at the end of, maybe like 2000, 2003. He was like, after all these years of flagellating ourselves over representation, where do we go next? And it seemed like there was a break for a minute where people got into thinking about a relational aesthetics and then they re-entered that form of this back and forth of fear over that maneuver. And so in the meantime, there's this great fear of doing that on the one hand. And at the same time, at least in the United States, like economic uh, inequality has worsened and worsened and worsened. And like by the time I was a PhD student in my program, like there were fewer women than there had been 10 years before. There were fewer people of color. Like anybody coming from adversity was kind of emptying out of these spaces of privilege in the institution who could be part of the table of making, you know, bringing those voices to the table. So they were being deprived of voice at the table to be heard. And when I was studying with Dennis Tedlock, who, you know, he was really into ethnopoetics and technicians of the sacred. I remember who, who recently passed away. Like, I remember he would, he would get he would get this like fiery look in his eye. He'd get really upset every once in a while. Like he'd go on this like rant about Edward Said, and he'd be like, you know, the real wound that we haven't gotten over since Edward Said. There's this misreading in him, which is that we assume that if we if we fail to represent each other, that we shouldn't do it at all. And on the one hand, yes, we need people to represent their own experience. Like I'm not a mother. I'm using, I'm using the material of mothers in my work. Like on the one hand, yes, we fail in representing the other, but the other side of the other danger is failing to regard them at all. And so like being in an institution where women are disappearing and especially since COVID, I mean, a lot of my former colleagues quit their careers as academics in COVID when they lost access to childcare. It's like, on the one hand, we can be afraid of appropriating wrongly, uh, but on the other hand, the, uh, the, the danger on the other side of that is xenophobia and fear of the other and fear of representing the other falsely to the extent that they cease to exist in that space at all. And so my concern as a writer and as a poet and as a member of the intellectual community is just like seeing the representation of maternal labor already lacking in the first place, now receding <laughs> during this time. And where do we put that? We can say, well, it's not for me to regard the labor of mothers because I myself am not a mother, therefore I have no right to talk about that on the one hand. But then to what extent are we depriving ourselves the ability to hear the lab maternal labor that's constantly at work in the making of language? Like 
I mean, mother tongue, right? Like your, your, like your mother is the one who teaches you, your, the, your maternal figure is the one who teaches you your inner critic, right? Like this is a huge mediating force in any conversation we could have about language, but we can hardly regard it. And for all the inequality that, especially breeding, the maternal breeding person in the family equation suffers in academia for jobs in these institutional spaces, like the disadvantage there and the gap to me seems worth the risk of on the surface appearing thieving or something. If it means I can like fight for the place of that voice at the table. So that's my thinking on appropriation. I don't know if I have a, a perfect answer because I think it's really complicated, but that's kind of how I understand my own intervention in that historical exchange we've been in for a while about that problem. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and, and we can we can continue to kind of talk about about that um, you know relation but you know you, you were uh, drawing us to drawing our attention to uh, be, you know between appropriation and you know all of these forms of precarity that that your book kind of touches on right all of these different and that's that's what's I think what's also interesting about the project right and I think Elena was was trying to also um, you know, kind of have you talk about that a little, right? How, you know, you're ultimately addressing a bunch of different forms of precarious, precariousness, right? And fragility and, and, and whatnot. And in what I wanted us to, you know, maybe talk about a little is the title of, of the book, which I found very interesting in how it, it, it sort of summarizes all of these different forms of, of um, again, like precariousness, right? Like, and, and I, you know, one thing, one particular line or one particular you know, phrase that you use in, in I believe, um, um, lesser, lesser uh, being, is, is it, lesser yeah, lesser person. being, lesser, lesser person, lesser person, mm -hmm. yeah, is, is, you know, that, uh, you know, um, fetal position is a meditation on form, right, is something you say, right, so I, I want to, you know, I want us maybe to talk a little bit about what that means, right, in the sense that, all of the, as, as Elena was saying, right, all of these different poems are, you know, very different from each other, right? like in how they, they're put together, right? But at mm -hmm. the same time, they all share this, this idea of, of, you know, um, or this, this concept or whatever, right, of, of, of the fetal position, right? What exactly does that mean, right? What I keep going back to, right, is this idea of, of not, not, I mean, of course, of fragility, right, of, of a baby, right? as something fragile, but at the same time, you know, it's a beginning of a life, right? This is you, you know, you, 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 you have that nice epigraphic at the beginning of the first poem, right? That, you know, the, about the birth of the new, right? And it's ultimately, right? It's also a meditation, as you said, right? The meditation on, on the creative process itself, all of these poems seem to be. And what I, what, you know, what I'm interested in, in maybe us, you know, talking about a little more is, what this idea, you know, this idea of fetal position, what, what does it mean, right? And uh, what I would say it meant for me, the way I took it was, it, it's, it's nice how you across the book sort of as use this, this idea or this form of folding, right? Like how you, you're always like folding distinctions between, for example, you know, the child and the animal, right? You have that, that very nice, uh, as we said, you know, lesser person, you know, is, you know, uh, supposedly about, you know, uh, a fictional child, but it's ultimately, it's, it's about your cat, right? This is, uh, this is actually something I hadn't thought of uh, at all, right? Like when I was reading the poem, I was like, well, she just, she's just being funny, you know, but, but then, you know, I read the review that you posted actually uh, last, uh, last <laughs> night. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yes, yeah, about the cat. <laughs> and and so it's interesting how the book keeps keeps um you know you know confusing all these categories you know human and animal and also the you know the last poem you know uh, is supposed to be also you know cat call right it's supposed to be uh you know something um you're, you're uh, you know um an address to a person right like a, a supposedly uh, uh but it's ultimately also infantilizing animalizing right objectifying you know, something Right, so there is that idea of folding there as well, right? So yeah, you know, just wanted to hear what you what you uh, 
have to say about how you came up with the title and whether you think the title kind of you know brings it all together and what it's the answer it's complex i mean it's a long story it's like me being like now i'm gonna read for 45 fucking minutes about this <laughs> like so making sense of it but okay here's my best attempt first i want to earmark just the the part about um cat call its process i did make it by i i when i had first moved to new york i was in a you know it's it's stressful when you move to a new city and you leave your life behind and all that. So I'm going through all this like transition. And I was, tra I transcribed all the things I was saying to my cat during that time. And then I, I sorted it into thematic piles. And then cat call was the pile of things that sounded like cat calling. So I, I moved to a neighborhood that had a lot of cat calling in it. So this was like kind of ambient processing in a way. Um, so that was kind of how that poem came about. But in terms of the like concept of the book itself, so like fetal position, it, this book has been, it's taken a couple different forms of the years what I thought it would be as an object. But at a certain point, I like cut it off. Like there's the obvious connotations of the word fetal position, like the fetal position, like, you know, crouching in the ball, right? That's like the image you get. There's all, and you know, the defensive stance of the fetal position, the victim position, you know, or when, when you feel victimized, often the body wants to move into this shape. Um, and then there's, of course, during this time, there's a lot of talk about, I mean, it's on the basis of the narratives we create about the fetus's right to owning a point of view and being uh, entitled to testify that women are losing the right to abortion in the United States right now, right? And so the ventriloquization of the what Agamemnon called the one who speaks but cannot testify, right? The, the one we project our narratives onto uh, that void that we're compelled to fill with meaning and, and cover over with language because we can't comprehend this thing that doesn't have language yet. So we have to, con you know, Agamemnon said, like, how much can you translate the other, how much can you transcribe sound, no, how much can you transcribe silence prior to translating it into sound? Like, the same problem, I think, is true when thinking about the actual fetal point of view, like, it's a horizon of thought, like we can't fully think it. And so it's something that's always receding over the horizon of comprehension, I think. And, and as we translate it into discourse, it's always deeply territorial and political and, and you know, all those things, not neutral. Um, so there's, it's obvious connotation, but then on a personal level, I mean, like there's a really personal side to it, which is, at a certain point, I looked at this pile of poems, the labor poems I had been making for some time, and I recognized there being a kind of common victim position in each of those poems and wanting to put a lid on that and wanting to stop making poems from that position for my own self. And I mentioned that on a personal note because I do think right now I'm making this new book called Inner Critic, A Journal of Inner Criticism, and it's just like with the idea that as the institution in the United States is like getting liquidated and downsized and all fucked up in the public sector that like we still need to listen to critics so I'm like listening to my inner critic and I'm transcribing it and the, the opening to that is kind of the whole project is dealing with the fallout of Mark Fisher saying that like I'll read the quote because I actually think it's useful here that like the pandemic of mental anguish that afflicts our time cannot be properly understood or healed if viewed as a private problem suffered by damaged individuals. And so like, I'm getting increasingly more interested in putting these private problems I'm having in public and dealing with them as symptoms of these failing systems we've built that are you know, barely functioning at this point in, in this <laughs> fucked up country. And like, to me, that's like a worthwhile thing to do. So I'm like, fine with wrapping, putting and drawing a circle around it being like, these are the fetal position poems that are written from that stance. If, if it can move something or I don't know, blow the speaker out of it. Um, but this is just to say that, it, it, and then there's this other part entirely, which is, I mean, I think since I was like a college freshman, like I've been working under the assumption that like, as Nietzsche talks about in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, like that the point of artistic action is the sacred yes like the point from the the perspective of the child who stands in childlike wonder of the world and the taking in of the world from that point of view is a foundation for artistic creation like he, he says this in the allegory of the the camel the lion and the child like the camel 
carries carries burdens put upon him unknowingly. The lion tears apart everything around him and the child stands there dumbstruck by the world itself. And that's the moment that artistic action happens or something. So to me, it's like, th this is a big circle of drawing. Like it's a really big synthesis of something. But if we're talking about poesis and making, it seems like a something worth drawing a circle around. Cool. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'll, I'll come back to that, to this uh, again. Uh, Elena, do you want to go ask the second one? Yeah. Um, well, the second question I had, uh, maybe you little, uh, talked about this a little bit already when you talked about appropriation earlier. But um, anyway, uh, for me, this is a book that asks intelligent questions and uh, particularly explicitly in the first part in reproductive labor and elsewhere too, but more implicitly there perhaps. But um, in, in the first part, we find, for example, is that how people come to want kids, the need for the object with their desire to be intelligibly, tangibly external from themselves? I can relate to that. And there are other ideas like the question of whether having a child is about making more world or finding a way to withdraw from the world as it is. So I feel like maybe on a broader level, it's a book about finding some kind of a contingent relation or a connection to the world and to the experiences of others. So on a broader level, maybe thinking about whether or not one might want a child, for example, maybe it's actually a question about one's relations to others and to the world. So uh, you talked about that. You talked about the other when you talked about appropriation. So do you then um, want to continue by commenting on the idea that maybe if we don't worry about appropriation, appropriating in the wrong way, perhaps maybe we can find ways to think about relations through poetry. So if we don't think about, wait, let me understand your question. So if we don't think about appropriation, then we can find other ways of working through appropriation in, in poetry. Is, was that the question? Uh, yeah, I think what I said is that if we don't worry about appropriating in the wrong way, then maybe we can find other ways of thinking about relations to others or something like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that like, like right now there's the style of poetry around me right now and my friends, like people are more in working in a more homogenous approach to writing than I've seen in a long time. There's a really heavy lyric mode. And that's very exciting. Like I remember seeing Marie Buck on this program saying, you ask her like, why, why work in this heavy lyric mode? And, and I remember her saying like, this is a moment where like, by working in this mode, we can find each other. That we're all working in this mode so that we can like reinforce a sense of community and belonging. Right. And so for me, like, it's weird in this moment after all of this, like kind of purging of conceptualist practices and experimentalism and, you know, these kind of like foundations of where discourse was after all this purging, it's weird to call this stuff, stuff together after 10 years and be like, here, here are a bunch of approaches. But to me on a gestural level, like it, it's meaning like, it's really important to me that we protect a diversity of styles and a diversity of poetic methods and a diversity of languages and dialects and tongues however wild and bizarre, you know, to, to protect pro the possibilities for poetic language itself, that we would have to keep a diversity wide and, and um, hospitable. Like there needs to be a kind of radical hospitality in place. I remember Myung Mi Kim used to talk about this a lot, that, that we would need to keep protecting that part. And so to me, having all of these different kinds of approaches, it's like, okay, let's take one, seemingly big idea but actually like just a form let's just take the fetal position and let's just take a community of approaches to that thing and and see what happens if that could come across in a way that's less than threatening perhaps if i use orality and musicality to lubricate that maybe this could broaden the the, the opening through which the, this diversity of tongues could pass through because for me it feels homogenous you know it, it what what scares me is the xenophobia of only self-representation in that space but like poetic language for a very long time has been in its bedrock like obsessed with articulating the unsayable and the unknowable 
and, and the thing beyond language. And so to, to probe into that um, and to expand the tongues we could use to do that, like, I, I, don't, I, think, I don't think that language is, a, is an easily intelligible material that we can like theorize cleanly and, and define universally. Like, I don't think we get universal narratives for explaining these things anymore, things like language things like poetry or poesis or the fetal position or making. Like what we have is a problem with like multitudinousness that we can barely tolerate, which brings out these behaviors of needing control issues, right? Like it feels good to control something smaller than yourself, right? Like as the idea gets too big and massive, like finding a way to recreate the world in miniature, like there's, there's relief in that act. And I can understand all of these behaviors on an institutional level of um, struggling over infractions over appropriation. But to me, you know, all these approaches, they're, they're in the interest of preserving a, diverse, a diversification of form at this moment. Cool. Ines? Um, yeah, so um, referring to, to this book, uh, Liz Howard said, um, as a reader, my body answered with gut laughter and unironic tears. And I couldn't agree with, the, with, with this affirmation more because one of the things that I found very interesting and intriguing at the same time was what I believe it is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, an exploration of humor that doesn't let the reader go away without reflecting on his own responsibility. And I think that reproductive labor illustrates what I am trying to say quite well. Uh, I mean, the, the reader who is probably laughing in the beginning of the poem, as we all were, is the same reader that is confronted with the following passage, and I'm going to read it. Is there any way to avoid that with the way our economy and ecology are going? What are the chances this world will get better and not worse? Less than 10% or more than 60? It seems like predictions matter when family planning. Do I need to be a sadist or want to assign another consciousness to partake in the end of the world? What is the difference between wanting a kid and wishing the end of the world on someone at this point? Surely, there are plenty of distinctions that could be made here between the desire to reproduce and the drive to punish. Tell me more about those. So what I want to ask you is, um, first, how do you perceive the comic effect in your poetry? And secondly, to what extent can humor be understood as a defense mechanism or as a weapon? And I am asking, of course, considering both as an act of resistance. That's an extremely beautiful question. And especially if you think about it from like a, <laughs> like a continuum of like, I remember my therapist telling me that like, that, that sad sadism and masochism don't exist separately. That at one point the victim in their victimization at their most extreme becomes victimizer. And it, it, it is a loop and that it exists in a circle. And to me like the, and it's not that I'm interested in BDSF because actually I find that whole discourse extremely uninteresting, but I am interested in the loop of one thing morphing into the other and then coming back into itself. And, and in that loop, like the humor for me is both a defense and a weapon. Like I, I come from a dark place in this world, not as dark as some, but like I, I, you know, I grew up working class. My, my mom cleaned houses. My dad was gone on boats six months out of the year. I didn't learn to read for pleasure until I was 18 years old because I was in these public schools that didn't know how to cultivate a relationship to reading that didn't feel punitive or like crowd control. And with a distrust in authority like I had growing up, it took a very long time to form that relationship with literacy. And so like when it comes to humor, like here I am, I'm in this space, this literary world, I'm, I'm alienated from it in all these ways where when people tell me this is how reading works or that's how, that's how reading works, this is how language works, a lot of it I hear it and I'm just like, it wasn't like that for me, like, I don't, as somebody who wasn't raised to love this, I never experienced it that way. And so like, I, humor I've learned as a survival tool to just laugh at the bullshit because other, I mean, you're, what are your other options, right? Like, it's a way of accepting the pain and, and just 
living with it and, and doing something else with it, transforming it as opposed to succumbing to it or something. So on the one hand, it's a weapon, it's, it's a defense against the pain. Uh, and on the other hand, like it's a weapon for fighting back. Like I, I really think that art is a way of surviving this life. And, and, and I don't mean being a patron of art and, and watching artists make it and, and buying the paintings you like. I mean like making it and exchanging it, looking at the art of your friends and handing it back and forth like as a tool for survival. And to me, like the greatest art I've found in my life for getting through this has been laughter. But in the meantime, like, I don't know, like poetry is like kind of an unfunny place. And like, I kind of like that it's not the designated place for humor to happen. Like I could have gone into comedy, like at an earlier time, maybe I, I don't, I don't mean, I don't want to flatter myself. I'm not trying to, I don't want to say here that I, I have any kind of like gifts, but I would say that like, I definitely as a young kid was like, oh yeah, like I would, I would love to go into comedy. You know, I had these like fantasies and stuff. And like, but, but in attempting to write in those genres, it didn't really fit that well. And, but it made sense in poetry because it, it, laughter is a kind of healing, um, but also can be a useful tool for finding responsibility in relation to really difficult things. Like, like Plissant says that, you know, folly is mistakes that, are ha that happen asocially. Error is when we do it in relation to each other. And this book is constantly showing the error ways uh, and, and bringing out the humor and finding who's laughing and who's not is certainly a tool for doing that. But I mean, also like one time in the pandemic, okay, can I tell you the story? Do we have time? What time are we supposed to conclude? Can I tell you a story? Okay, because it's kind of crazy. So in the pandemic, I was like sedentary as hell. Joey and I were living in a smaller one bedroom apartment. We were taking, and, and there was, daylight in one room and then it was like it was a it was a long hallway by a freeway this apartment and so one room had daylight and the other one didn't so as we were both teaching online uh taking turns each day who got to have sunlight that day and who didn't like fucking like on our headsets like teaching from our cubicles like some fucking people in like parasite or something <laughs> like we, we you know it was dark times and I was like every time things don't go well for me there's there is this voice in my head that's like should have gone into comedy. You could be having fun right now. You could be talking with fun people right now who, who, who would rather be having fun. You could just be fucking enjoying yourself. But no, we had to go into literature. We had to pick the painful thing. Here we go. You know, so like I have this voice that like the minute things aren't going well, is like we could have been having fun right now, but no, we had to do this instead, right? So one day in the pandemic, you know, it's getting intense and I'm like, all right, fuck it let's try it. And I was like, I'm going to write a stand-up bit. Let's see what happens. I'm going to do this. So then I sit down one night, Joey's like out for the night. And I'm like, I can do this. so I'm like writing the stand-up bit. And as I'm writing it, I'm like, oh shit, this is funny. Oh my God, this is really funny. And I'm like, it's like coming out. And I'm like, oh fuck. Oh God, that's fucked up. Yeah, that's dark. Ha ha ha. And so like, as I'm writing it, I'm like laughing and laughing. At a certain point, there's like tears coming down my face. And I'm, it's not just like, it's not like the sad clown tears. It's like, I'm like, you know, like gutturally laughing at what I'm writing. And I'm like, this is hilarious, this is hilarious. So I go to bed that night. I'm like, maybe I did go into the wrong career. What the fuck was I thinking? So the next day I get up and I'm like, okay, maybe I should like do, maybe I should like clean that up a bit. You know, it was like a rough draft. I'll take a look at it. So I go back through it and I read it the next day. And it was like, there wasn't a single punchline there weren't jokes. It was just rage and vitriol. It was a, it was a cascade of anger. And as I was writing it and as it was coming out of me, that was hilarious. But in itself, on the page, outside of the context of like performance or intervention in relation to an audience, in relation to a world in which that thing appears, like it just didn't, it just spread like pain. And I was like, how do I, I guess I'm not good at writing this shit at all because there isn't a fucking joke to be found in here. So then I was like, okay, well, I'll just keep making poems then. So then I doubled down. But so, yeah, I mean, I, I like, I'm obsessed with humor. It's not worth it to me if it's not funny. Like I, it, the, the bottom payoff for me is the lols. And like, people think I'm not serious for that or like, I'm just here to be a jackass or, you know, make mischief. But it's like, if we can't have that, what can't we have? That's my very long answer to that question. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but actually, you said that poetry is not the designated place for humor, but I think that 
in in this case it makes perfect sense because yeah. the mixture of um techniques you use uh, in your poems as elena was saying well they are all uh, experimental techniques and probably and correct me if i'm wrong the the main objective is always transgression and you can find that through humor totally yeah totally I, I was gonna I was actually gonna so it is actually took a a question I was gonna ask I was I was gonna actually ask you about the humor side of things and because so for example the the first poem in the book uh I believe we you know it's uh reproductive labor I think yes first good poem. memory look at you you didn't even look at it there you go you went off to uh, impressive so you know I I remember listening to it I actually even sent it when I was you know you know, trying to you know incite um, to you know um, ask Inish to to join us and you know participate in this session. I, I even sent her a video of you reading that that particular poem at a UDP event a couple of months ago. And you know, and just just the whole uh, environment in in you know in, in which you're reading it, I think really you know makes a difference because in, you know in that particular event, right, like everyone's laughing. Everyone's cheering and you know laughing at you know whatever you, you're saying, right? And, and it's funny that you're saying there's no, there's no punchlines in the, in the poem, right? But I think that as as Inez was, was suggesting um, before, um, you know the, the the what's what's so interesting about this project is as well is that you're 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 sort of uh, uh, bringing um, or drawing attention to all of these forms of you know hesitation, right, and doubt. And has uh, you know confusion, right? And that I think that that's also something that uh, I believe was in is also referring to the same review that I'm keep keep going back to that was posted yesterday. I don't know, but but I remember that that reviewer in particular was was uh, you know drawing this comparison between your work on on Stein, right, and this particular project, right, which is of course very very different, right? But there is definitely right a, a sort of a, there is something funny, right? It, precisely in that unfinished, uh, side, as Elena would say, unfinished business, right? unfinished side of things, especially- oh, the... Unfinished business with Stein. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go on, go on. No, 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 I don't have an answer. I was just echoing. I got excited. No, it, no it's just, I think, again, like to go back to, you know, that 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 image of the fetal position, right? Of, you know, in, uh, of infancy, right? Uh, as, as a source of, of creativity and potential, right? At the same time as, as, as you know, an, uh, a place of violence, right? As you, you know, keep going, keep, keep you know, uh, pointing out, right? A place of violence, but also uh, of, of like, of, of creativity. And uh, um, so it's interesting how you you do focus on all of these forms of precarity and, and ultimately do find something creative and funny and, you know, and, and uh, um, some potential in, in them, right? Even student labor, right? Which is, uh, you know, again, like just a poem about hesitation and doubt and, and, and being stuck, right? Being stuck in, in, you know, not being able to sort of finish uh, having a finalized, you know, as, as we all know, as also teachers ourselves, right? <laughs> right? Finding a- you guys know that, pain. <laughs> right, you know. I have to learn it before I could give that to you, but <laughs> you know, when I find it, I don't. <laughs> no, but you know, I guess I guess my question. Sorry for all the rambling, but I guess my question was, you know, what if you if you know reading this poem to us, right, in a silent room, mm -hmm. right, because you are even you know ultimately reading it to yourself, right? Like we weren't really mm -hmm. reacting to the poem, right? It, you know, do you do you find that it you know adds something to it to read it silently? Right to read it in as we kind of did, right? We read it in silence, right? We weren't really. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, I I mean, the silent reading thing is like it's a whole thing for me because like I'm an oral listener and so I just have less interest in the silent page than I do in the living page, like in oral delivery and and these other kinds of modes. Um, like, there's actually two versions of reproductive labor out there. There's this version, which is the performance version, which was read at, it was the whiskey reading. It was days before we went into isolation. And it, I read at the end of the whiskey reading. So with each reader, each reader was paired with a whiskey 
And then they said like everyone got a shot of whiskey for each reader. So by the time I got up there, people were just like <laughs> plastered. <laughs> Why you like barely hear it. Um, and then, uh, wait, what was I talking about? Okay, so there's that version. This is the performance version that's in here. The exact version I read at that reading. Um, and then there's this other version that went out on Bomb Magazine that was edited for silent reading, like literally edited to just like flip through it on a phone. And it's, it's super boiled down and it's super edited for conciseness and it's not written to be read out loud. Like I was like, oh, I should read this version of my readings because it'll go faster and I can fit more in. And then I started trying to read it and I was like, oh, this is like, this, you can't, this sounds like shit. It's all choppy and like, it doesn't, doesn't make sense out loud. And so to me, that version that I made with Bomb, really it's like a silent version, a silent reading version of that. But I was really interested in doing that work with them because what is reading for the silent page? I mean, that took me a very long time in my life to even develop an a, a ability to engage that way. I mean, when I, when I was a kid in school, like reading, silent reading was like what we did as punishment. And so like seeing authorship, being in relation to authority in a way where you yourself don't just feel subordinated by that authority, but are also an equal player in that situation. Like I needed that part of the equation to find a purchase in that kind of mode. And so anyways, I'm kind of starting from the point, but, um, so silent reading, fetal position, these pieces are very much meant to be read out loud. And so it, it's meaningful to hear that anything honestly came across outside of the context of it reading. Because for me, like every single one of these pieces was edited by writing it, reading it in front of an audience, editing it based on where the laughs hit and where they didn't, reading it again, editing it again, right? So like every single thing in here is like fine tuned for that. But then in COVID, there's like no, no further place to test that. So now as a result, and there was a period after Troll Thread or during Troll Thread, I mean, not after Troll Thread, but I mean, I've, I've been getting less readings over the years because print on demand books are technically considered by the MLA vanity publishing. And so they're not taken as seriously as real books. Like people talk about this book as my first book, as my debut book, but it's like, I've been making books for 10 years. I have seven books. Like I've, I've put seven books out, but they don't technically qualify, which includes like for jobs, like I'm a fucking adjunct. You know, <laughs> I don't have any financial stability. I don't have a financial future in this in this work. And so to me, like keeping the human embodied situatedness of the work connected to, you know, connected to its situationalness. Uh, that to me is really important because there's this exploitation in the university framing all the ways we now talk about language at the scene of instruction in the adjunctification of the university, especially here in the United States. And like, if you're not Ivy Leagued, if you're not really independently sponsored, your chances of getting a, a full-time permanent job or any financial future in discourse as an academic participant in this discourse is so small. And so like, we would need to start acknowledging those parts of the framework of making what we're calling language at the scene of instruction. Um, so yeah, like abuse culture, uh, transgressions of boundaries, the collapsing of the distinction between the parent and the child and all the exploitation in between, all of that becomes very important. Anyways, yeah, that was a long answer. Long question though, so I blame you, Joao. <laughs> yeah, it was a long question, sorry about that. Okay. Guys, do you, do, you, do you wanna add anything? You wanna ask a, a last question? No. Okay. Um, the. No. Yeah. I mean, the the. It's interesting that, though that that you you. I mean, you. I I have the idea, right? As I told Joey last time that uh, I mean, I always found you guys really funny, right? Uh, but but I had no idea that you were like editing for, editing it for laughs. That that's really like uh, oh, another yeah, way. No. <laughs> This is all and, I get in this. This is this. This is the only real pleasure I get in this life. Is <laughs> laughter. Like if we can't have laughter, I don't. I don't want it. So. <laughs> no, it's, it's interesting. I mean, interesting also. Like that. That Joey. I mean, last time we, we were uh, sort of you know um, asking him about the you know the, the same thing, right? Like uh, you know how come your your poems are usually so funny and this one's so serious, right? Like how you know what happened? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's funny. 
Yeah, he, I mean, yeah, I, I found the poems funny nonetheless, right? Like even, yeah, even, funny. even though he was trying to make it very, I mean, I think he thinks he's funny as well. I mean, he didn't tell you this, but he's from the Midwest. Their sense of humor is the darkest, driest humor. <laughs> always bordering on imperceptible and that's what's exciting about it as a form of humor is that it's so dark you almost can't yeah, see it right, as right. humor. Yeah, very good. No, but, but he seemed he seemed uh, like you know um, surprised that we found it like funny he was like ah, come on you know <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. he is also <laughs> deadly serious he's both it's it's very <laughs> dr jekyll and mr Hyde. <laughs> no, but but uh, you know, to to sort of go back to and, and we can we can end there. You know, sort of go back to something that Inej was saying uh, earlier, that you know the fact that uh, you know and this is something I wanted to 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 say before when I asked you the question about you know reading it aloud, and uh, you know in front of um, an audience, right? Like, what's the difference, like between you know that and silent reading right and and i think you know it's interesting that you know although the poem is of course very funny right all the poems are fit, are funny right what, what i think the silent reading side of things adds right is that it makes the humor maybe more ambiguous which is i think what the uh, inish was was kind of saying i think before right is that the yeah. the the whole ambiguity and and uh, those layers of meaning that that i think all of the poems uh, sort of encompass uh, are you know enhanced by you know um reading it silently right so it you know although right you there is like a whole like entertainment side of this 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 kind of poetry that we're missing right that you're now mm -hmm. adding to it right although I, I do think it's very it's kind of weird right like reading it on zoom it, wasn't it maybe weird for you uh, as opposed to, you know, it's super weird and bothersome. Right? Because I can't, I like at one point I caught your face getting kind of red, wow, and like kind of like sort of laughing. And I was like, okay, thank God, because this is fucking this is uncomfortable. <laughs> imagine, yeah, that's, I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you know, just just to add that, um, I, I, I think it 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 gains something, right? I think the project mm -hmm. gains something from the mm -hmm. You know, read aloud and you know in front of people, etc. But but it, you know it, it's also um, nice, right? That we, you know, that the jokes sort of you know enhance the other side of things as well, right? The whole maybe more conceptual, more you know, uh, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks so much, uh, Holly, and uh, thank you guys for for coming. Thank you so much. For having me you guys seriously this was such a wonderful uh, conversation completely my honor and pleasure so so thank you no and i and i hope that that you know people over here and you know maybe in finland as well right but and and, and elena you have you know you have the, the advantage of being in touch with two different countries in, in scandinavia so <laughs> i'm so jealous every time i look at your cell on the screen elena i'm like you're in sweden like oh my god and you have access to this finished part you're <laughs> of the universe here <laughs> uh yes that's nice <laughs> you know no, but, but you know but i do hope that you know people go out and, and get get the book because it's really i mean you as you as we were saying before right like it it uh this this very nice review came out yesterday and it was mm -hmm. more than, you know best one of the yeah. best books of 20, 2021 yeah, one of the art forums best of 2021 that as uh, as seen by jackie s yeah. So congratulations on that. And uh, thanks again, Holly. Thank you so much. Thanks and uh, me. thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, and I'll see you Take care. all uh, next month, next episode. So see you then. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you.